soil. And I realized how important root growth and stuff are, is. And I took my, uh, took some courses at ASU before I took my tie off. I was still doing this um, only part time was I doing any commercial work. Occasionally I would do the entrance to a neighborhood or um, they'd give me a set of uh, a hole, you know, on a golf course. It would allow me to pick some grasses and do some cool stuff with it. But I really wasn't into it as far as being paid for it. Um, then when I went ahead and got my master gardener certification and took my tie off, I started doing a little bit more professionally and uh, moved to Phoenix or moved from Phoenix there to uh, Prescott. And I just as soon as I walked in, there were two things that I did uh, that were marked on the calendar. One was come and talk to Ken and Lisa and see if I could work here because it's a really uh, sensational nursery and well uh, acclaimed on a national level, not just a state level or a local level. And uh, so I wanted to come from a place of knowledge so that I could learn more. But the other thing I did was um, join the woodworking class at Yavapai College. So you're actually helping me today with my wood allowance for my shop. So I'm on plant restriction right now. I can't take home any more plants. Uh, that was mentioned specifically, so I can buy a couple boards on the way out, but um, um, no more no more bramble for me today. So we're gonna talk about what ails you and how to uh, combat it. And I'm gonna start with just, I'm gonna start from the ground up, literally. And we'll talk about a bunch of different things as we get into the leaves and your fruit and, and production. And then um, we'll open it up for questions. Unless you've got something like a burning desire where you've got to know right now about something, I'm just going to launch. The uh, soil that you have here predominantly is decomposed granite. And it will work its way into a clay and it will work its way into a caliche, which is the hardest part. And that's a colloquialized local term, a caliche. It's just a hard clay. And uh, the clay is your decomposed granite uh, with different elements locking up your nutrients and causing it to repel the water instead of letting it roll through. It's almost on the dust side when it's uh, completely dried out. That's hence the big cracks and stuff like that. And there are ways to combat that when you have uh, high pH in your soil, which is what the decomposed granite has and high pH in your water, uh, well, bound together with the calcium from your hard water, you get stuff locked up in there. Your nutrients are unavailable to, or not as available to the plants. When we bring in non-indigenous plants, you see some things that grow really well, uh, they're from here. You know, the stuff we bring in, you try to put a tomato in that, or a raspberry in that, or a pear tree in that, you have to amend that so it will live better. With those amendments, we bring uh, invitation to different pests. And they can be uh, anything that's irritating is I would consider a pest. It could be a mold and it could be a bug. Uh, you have uh, the definition of a weed. You know, it's something you don't want. And uh, Datura, for example, is a really beautiful flower. It's very toxic and hallucinogenic, and you might not want it in your yard. But to those who like the species, it's a really pretty plant. People will pay for it, and you might want to kill it. So it, the definition of what's a pest and what's not. Nematodes are in the soil also, and that's a definition of what's a pest and what's not. Some nematodes will eat your roots, and others are beneficial nematodes, and they will actually eat. I don't. We don't sell them but they are available. You, you can put them in your soils and they will eat the larva for fire ants. They'll eat the larva for your, all your little bugs and stuff like that. They're, they're uh, really, really a neat little critter if you buy the beneficial nematode. If you don't, then you're gonna set yourself up for problems. The way that you're gonna combat your soil problem with your high pH and in your, in, your, uh, in your water and in your soil is you're gonna add acid. And that's where how much acid do I add? How much um, mulch do I put in the hole? There's the same questions essentially, because you're going to create acid with humic, humeric material or um, mulch. Your decomposing material generates acid and feeds your soil. 
and that will blow apart that this molecular bond that we were talking about initially. When you have high pH and you have all these minerals that are available inside of the decomposed granite and you add high calcium which from your hard water, it locks a bunch of that up and it makes it turn into clay and into caliche and binds the nutrients together so your plants can't pick it up. <clears throat> Acid blows that molecular structure apart and allows those nutrients to now be available. At the same time, if you have your plant trying to pick up the nutrients that you've now made available and its pH is out of balance, if you can balance the pH, much like in our bodies, balance the pH in the plant, then it's able to pick up the nutrients better. So the short is acid is good. Where you get your acid, we can get into a couple of different elements of that. If you have a yellowing, here's one of our symptoms of, that we're going to talk about. If you have a yellowing on your plant, uh, and it manifests itself in a couple of different ways, the leaves just don't look as green. Or I've got a red tip photonia, and its red is pink. It's not really red. Um, I am not getting the fall color I want out of my maple. It's supposed to be out of blaze maple, which is going to be a blaze, not just kind of a rusty color. That's an acid imbalance. You can up the quality of your plant and the production of its product, whether it's fruit, vegetables, or um, color, by adding acid to the soil. The other additive that I, uh, aside from going to iron, now you can actually do damage with, um, with adding iron. So you have to be really careful with that. And that's why syst um, systematically I will go acid first. And if I don't get results in a couple of weeks, then I may go, if you have real iron deficiency, I might go to iron. But I'm going to try acid first to create a balance in the soil and a balance in the plant's uptake. There might be enough iron in the ground, it just can't pick it up because the pH is out of balance, okay? <clears throat> We're going up into your structure of your plant, at the base of the plant, when we plant something, there's always pathogens in the soil, and that's not necessarily a bad thing. There are things that eat the mulch um, and create better soil. There's things that will um, just set up a good working environment. If you go, uh, if you plant your plant too deep, I'm talking about woody structures now. Not, tomatoes is the only plant that you really, I really advocate putting a couple of inches of the stalk in the ground. Uh, but your Underneath the bark of your woody plants, uh, whether they be shrubs or trees, there you scratch that, that green is uh, aristomatic material. That's the material that um, it's got a lot of functions, but one of them is, do I put out a branch, do I put out a root? Um, and it's also the flow of the good and the bad and the moisture and everything like that in the plant. The meristomat, the material that turns from stalk to roots the roots can handle light and uh, air better than the stalk can handle the pathogens of the soil. So when, if you're having trouble with your shrubs newly planted or your tree newly planted, it can be that you just planted it too deep and that's a problem with your plant that I would like to start with rather than starting with chemicals. You're, you could just have planted it too deep but you dug the hole too deep and it sunk or you actually planted it too deep out of love and you uh, have these new pathogens up against the bark, which create problems. Uh, in that planting, we don't want to put too much mulch in the hole uh, because you can create, again, you're loving it to death. You think this hole, this dirt's really crummy. It's not, it just has to, you have to learn to release the nutrients in it. Um, if you put too much mulch in the hole, you set yourself up for uh, air pockets, which can cause root rot. And I would rather solve that with uh, planting properly or adding sand rather than adding uh, copper to it, right? Don't just kill it, fix it. And um, you'll also end up with cold roots in the winter because you'll have these air pockets and uh, there'll be moisture or dry air in there and you'll have, so plant, uh, you'll have cold roots. Planting properly by not adding too much mulch is a good step in the right direction as well. If you're suffering from a problem with too much air in the hole because you have too much mulch, realize that these plants, whether it's a tree or just a plant, 
they're grown in 100% mulch. And it, over time, a couple of years, um, my aspen tree looks crummy and I'm putting all the water I can stand on it and I don't know what's happened. Well, yeah, I planted a 20 gallon aspen tree that was grown in 20 gallons of mulch. And this breaks down and goes away and leaves airspace in the holes. Get yourself a bag of um, topsoil instead of mulch, let pour it around the base, water it and use it as an opportunity for your deep water. You'll see almost all of it disappear. That's the sand filling in the air pockets that were created by the mulch breaking down. And then you can feed your plant effectively. So there's a, those are trying to get to cause and effect without going to chemicals. Inside of your chemical uh, and your solutions to some of these problems, um, there's talk of biometric versus chemical. And there's, you know, does it work on the plant naturally or the animal naturally? Can I eat it afterwards? What's the side effects? You know, can I can use it on my flowering pear tree, but can I use it on my regular pear tree? There's a lot of ways of solving bug infestation that are going to be helpful to to the plant and not as detrimental to you. We've seen the, the big no, no was um, Roundup, right? Uh, another pest is just as simple as a weed or a flower where you don't want it. And then all of a sudden the plant takes it up and puts it into the ground and you've got a carcinogen in the ground. So there's other chemicals that people have tried to come out with that haven't been around long enough to be investigated properly. So we're going to try and do some things that are a little bit more natural or understand the plant and the way that things work so that you can treat things effectively. If you want to go with systemics, for example, these drenches are way effective for uh, boring insects. And we're not talking about insects with no personality. We're talking about insects that bore into the trees. <laughs> and so you're, you put this in a drench around the base of the tree. The tree takes it up. It goes through that meristematic material. Now when the, when the bug goes to bite it, it's toxic to taste and nothing else. It might actually kill the critter that's eating it, eating your tree. Uh, this to me is uh, the, the, some of the benefits to this for as an example for a fruit thank you as an example for a fruit tree and try and remember this as we go through some of these other examples the um, stem whether it's a tomato or a cherry the stem is your last strain of um, pulling out nutrients but also pesticides it's a filter if you will the molecular structure of this particular product from the homework that i've done is too fat to go through the stem it's not recommended for cherry trees and for fruit trees unless you do it at the right time of the year because you don't want it in the flower when your bees are on it but after the flowers are gone then you can use it in the tree because that last stem is going to filter it out if you're using it on ornamentals I would like for you to go first to check whether or not you have air in the holes. If you planted that ornamental, has the uh, is the root ball exposed through the technique we talked about earlier, getting some sand in there. If you don't want to buy um, bagged topsoil, go down in the creek bed and get some fine stuff and lay it around the base of your tree, put some granular fertilizer on it and water it. If you're walking, if you're talking about a native that's been in your yard for a long time that is struggling. That's a great way to combat a disease that's coming in. Bugs are with us all the time, and they will return because they're here all the time. The first line of defense for the tree with any plant is the health of the plant. And so if you can get your, as a, uh, a pine, for example, if a critter bites it, it wants to drown it with sap. If it hasn't been watered properly and isn't healthy, it can't drown it with sap, and the critter just bores and reproduces and bores and reproduces and kills the tree. Some of these plants that are 25 years old die in front of you. Uh, you've been dying for six months, you just haven't been able to see it, and you can't do anything about it. Just get yourself a new tree. What you can do is check the root ball and see if you have problems so that, that you don't duplicate, okay? Some of this stuff, we had we had a no-lo bait last year for grasshoppers. That was a bait that people would, that grasshoppers would come in and eat, and they would take it to their young, and they would go crazy, and there's a bunch of gory details involved. 
really hard to get this year. So we've been on the search for what can kill grasshoppers safely. And one of them is this turf ranger. The turf ranger is a water activated, water activated product. Um, granular, throw it in the yard, sprinkle water, sprinkle it with water. That'll turn it on that anything in it with an exoskeleton, grasshoppers, crickets, walks across it. Um, they can transfer it to others while they're cleaning themselves and it will kill them. It is chemical based. It will not transfer from the literature that I've read to the bird that eats the grasshopper. So it doesn't have the secondary kill effect. And that's kind of what I'm looking for in that. One that's a little safer for your fruits and vegetables that I found that we had, and I hadn't even realized it, as high yield builds a really good product. This, if you go back and look on the label, please read all of your labels on everything that you have. But if you're growing sweet corn, one of the things in here is grasshoppers. If you're growing beets, one of the things in here is grasshoppers. But this is built to be safe for your vegetable garden. So please, just because you're killing the bug doesn't mean that you want to be eating the corn, okay? One of the other things that I really like to use, this is not an insect, this is a gopher. One of the things that I like to use is zinc. This is not toxic to, uh, zinc isn't really harmful to a lot of other animals. It stops up the digestive system of rodents and they can't digest it and they die. Now, you can pour it down the hole. You want to be really careful. You don't want to pour it. You, know, you don't want your dog eating it by mistake, but if the dog happens to pick up the, the chew on the rat, then he's not going to die. Um, that, so there's other things that you want to look for when you're reading the label. How does it kill? And what's the secondary kill if it has it? That's something very important. So you can deter critters you know, deer stop and some other things. And there's a lot of, uh, I'm not a big fan of, of these particular products. I have, but when you're in a dire situation where you don't have the big fence and you want to get the, you want to change their orientation of the rabbit in your yard, then there's success with these things. The other one that works really well, that um, it may be a little gray information for you, but I'm going to go out on a limb, male human urine. They don't, most animals do not like it. It's not a taste, it is a scent. When you first plant something, your javelina are more likely to dig up the plant for the roots because they smell the disturbed earth, earth and, they, and they can smell fresh roots or grubs. So you can deter them with some smell. You can use any one of these and you can get them to change their mind. This is what they're after, all right? They're, they wanna get to this fresh, the fresh dirt that you just stirred up is what they can smell. That's what brings them into the yard. Again, when you're planting these things, remember, this is 100% mulch, right? And when it breaks down, it leaves air pockets in your soil. So a couple of years from now or a year from now, you're going to want to add sand to this to take up those air pockets. This is one of the reasons why a perennial has a hard time in the winter. We turn off our sprinkler systems and we freeze dry our perennials and we wonder why they just barely came back instead of coming back really lush and beautiful. Water, feed them and add some sand in the middle of the winter. This is one of the examples that is um, not a flavorful thing for the javelina and the, and the rabbits and the deer. They don't really like some of these plants we put up here and uh, they'll stay away from them. It's not something you plant in the garden to deter them except for maybe a marigold or two but they'll go around them and they'll eat the other things. So you have to be careful of that. When you're inside of the plant and you start to see some issues, um, bugs, spider mites, things like you can tell looking at a spider mite, if uh, these are real susceptible to spider mites, but they can get into a lot of things. Your dwarf alberta spruce, and it's really hard to get them out of the spruce. It's a really, really fine web. It's not a big long web that goes from tree to tree. That's just a spider. And so you can tell the difference between the two. The ways that you're gonna kill these things is you're really gonna hose them down and um, get underneath them if you can, go to the dollar store or the dollar 25 store now and get yourself some cheap sunglasses and do it in the evening so that the wind isn't blowing as much. And most of these liquids is, are not set up for killing over a long period of time. They're contact killers. So you wanna get the critter wet with them and you want it to stay wet longer 
and they will have some sticking agents in them, such as your neem oils and, and uh, or horticultural oils. You don't want to burn the leaf by doing it in the morning when it's still, and then having the intense sun on the leaf. That takes me full circle to your oils, neem oils and your horticultural oils. Sometimes the horticultural oil is nothing more than mineral oil. And you want to be careful about when, what time of year you're putting these things on. Now is not a good time because of the heat. They do work through suffocation. They're not a toxin in their own right, much like your old remedies of dishwashing soap. You know, you will suffocate. You'll actually do damage to the exoskeleton of the critters with the soap. What, what, how much is too much? You know, you're going to kill your, are you going to kill your plant with, by giving it a bath every other day? My opinion is just kill the darn bug, you know, and then you, if you want to use your neem oils and stuff like that later, that's great. But there's a time when you got to get serious about it, just kill them. Because it, you'll go backwards. You'll, neem oil will work in one season, you think it's really great, and you're out there spraying at this time of year on some of your plants and you scorch the plant. You're putting oil on them in the heat, which is a good, uh, and you're causing this this reaction with the sunlight, which is also not good for your leaves. So just be really careful about that. Get something that will actually kill the critter and then learn what kills the critter. This is um, Sayonara, aptly named because you'll see you later for insects. This is a pyrethrin based or a synthetic pyrethrin. It's not um, a pyrethrum when you see the M on the end of it. That is straight from the chrysanthemum plant. And just because it's from a plant, we like to think that that's healthy. Well, cyanide is from a, uh, is from a plant. So, you know, there's a lots of toxicities out there just because they're plant-based doesn't make them safe. All right. This has a really good short half-life. It starts breaking down pretty quickly. It will kill the bug and it won't transfer to secondary killers necessarily. It is a contact killer. In some instances, it will hurt some secondary eaters of those bugs, but you can spray this on a tomato to kill your bug, to kill your worms, and then you can rinse it off and eat the tomato. So as far as it being a systemic, it is not. It, uh, the, the instructions on this will say to make an application and uh, wait you know, a, a certain period of time. That's all very well and good. What I've experienced up here, some of the labels, including how to grow a plant, will be geographically written. I advocate an application in once and then again in like three to five days. You'll catch different larva stages in what you're killing and they won't, they will respond differently. And when they're in an eating reproduction mode, you want them dead, dead, so that they're not coming back and, you know, the remnant isn't coming back and reproducing really strong. In saying that, caterpillars and some other pests are really, um, persistent and it, inside of this natural form of killers instead of just purely chemicals um we talked about the zinc we talked about the pyrethrum the bt in this in this uh in this uh caterpillar killer this is a great product and this is one of the true biometric killers they it's not thermicide what is it bacillus uh, some it's from, I'll, I'll butcher the name but it's BT, uh, bacillus thermicide or thermidide. But this is actually plant, microscopic plant. And you spray it on, on stuff, the caterpillar picks it up, and the plant starts growing inside of the buck. And yeah, wow, that's right. And it's perfectly harmless to the bird that comes and picks off the caterpillar. It's designed for non vertebrates, but it's a really great, safe product for you've got the tomato worms which become a really pretty moth. So you don't want to kill them when it's a beautiful moth. Well, they come back to where they're born and they make more tomato worms. The big horn tomato worms are really pretty moth. So kill them when they're small, and, but do kill them. Don't just treat them as pets and, and watch them grow. One of my favorite things to do with the big caterpillars if I don't feel like spraying is I put them in the bird bath dry and the birds find them almost immediately. You can grow some things that are uh, really re resistant, and a lot of them are in your herbs, herb families. The, um, the rosemary is prone to some of the mites and stuff, but uh, it's so tough, you're more likely to get a root rot from too much mulch in the hole 
that will hurt this guy before you'll get a bug that will hurt this guy. He's not going to deter the bugs from coming into the garden, but this particular plant won't be affected. I don't put this one in the garden because of his uh, aggressive roots. He'll take up a bunch of moisture. So he's more like a border plant or architecturally pretty in the yard. Um, but if, if you put him in your herb garden, you're going to have trouble getting enough moisture to the rest of your herbs. Your lavenders are a really pretty, very durable plant. Again, make sure that you're feeding them in the winter and that you don't have too much mulch in the hole. Don't love them to death. This and uh, the rosemary or the uh, oregano and creeping thyme. That very edible. Uh, the creeping thyme and the oregano are evergreen. You can walk on them. You can eat them. They bloom in the summer. It's a great path liner. doesn't have to stay in your herb bed. Uh, when you go into, I don't know how many people cook a lot, I cook a lot. When you go into the interiors of Mexico, all up and down the Yucatan, this is used a whole lot more in 500-year-old recipes than cilantro. And um, it's just a really great plant. It's going to look a little auburn after two feet of snow, but it is an evergreen, as is the creeping thyme. These are almost toxic. And, uh, well, both of the... Um, the periwinkle, which is the ground cover, that is an evergreen that does real well up here in partial, partial shade. And this as an annual, this will uh, replace itself through seeds. The plant itself won't make it through the winter, but critters don't like it. And you can put it in, out in full sun. You can keep it in hanging baskets. It's really a delightful plant. What was that one? Um, Vinca. Oh, yeah. So there's, when someone asks you for a vinca, they may be talking about the ground cover vinca, which is an evergreen. This is an annual and uh, the multiple colors and that uh, will reseed itself. Your poppy is, is almost indestructible and uh, critters don't like it. it can, it's just out in the open. Uh, we have a quarter cup, I think it's 11 bucks or something like that. You know how many seeds are in a quarter cup of poppies? It's a beautiful thing to put out right now before the monsoons. That we're hoping to get. While well, you have cracks in your decomposed granite soil, right? That it can fall in between. So, and uh, triple action is a really good one this time of year to be using, not just on your ornamentals, but be very careful with this. Uh, it's got a, uh, a miticide, a fungicide, and an insecticide. And this time of year, when we have the humidity, June being probably our hottest month before the clouds and stuff come in and our and one of our more humid months. So you're, you can see um, your funguses and stuff come up and it's not bad to have a little copper uh, sulfite on them, uh, which is inside of this as the fungicide. And pay attention to what you're um, ingesting, please. Uh, there was a gentleman in here the other day that didn't want to tell me what he was growing and he was having a fungus problem and he wanted something to kill the fungus and he was gonna buy a bottle of, just based on that description, had I not interrupted the conversation, he was gonna buy a bottle of the, of the copper spray to put on his marijuana to take home and put it in his pipe. You know, don't do that. Pay attention to the use of the plant and then what you're putting on it. And by the way, you can take that out and put it in the open air uh, not sunburn it, just get a little extra circulation and cause your... So if you if you look back there, there's two clipboards. Yeah. Okay. They have uh, sheets for you to sign up for information that Kevin's giving, which is sort of like trying to drink through a fire hose. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. So what we will do is we will send you links to several videos for example, we have a video on this turf ranger. We have a video on a Sayonara and so on. If you sign up for that, you'll get that. My guess is probably Tuesday, Wednesday time frame. Okay. If you are already on our current list, you need to sign up here because this just goes to the people that are here at the class and people that give us their email address on our live streams. Doesn't go out to every all ten thousand people we have on our email list. And you're not going to arbitrarily get information from Fertilome or one no. of our other products. No, we don't suppliers. share any of that. And Good some point. of this is a little bit those of you those of you that have been shopping with us for several years. 
There was a couple of the companies that were instrumental in helping us develop our own private labels, and they have dropped that service. They're not providing private labels anymore. That's why you see new products on our shelves. They are essentially what we were making uh, with their formula. So they're not quite what we have developed, but they're sufficient. That's why we're the educational program. Also, if you're going to go in and try and grow some fruit trees or some roses, go to waters.com and go to the learn column and look up. These are all recorded, whether it's about bugs or root rot or planting an orchard. And you can save yourself some frustration and some money by watching a couple of different videos from different people about that particular product before you come in and buy some art. So you have specific questions or if you have a plant that you brought with you, some leaves or something like that, we can go in after class and look at it under the microscope. There's a good number of the people that are in aprons here that are um, either master gardeners or um, nurserymen, certified nurserymen or both. And there's a lot of knowledge and application here. And if you, yes, sir. Uh, a little bit over symptoms of overwatering and underwatering. Sure. How plants respond and what you should look for. You bet. Uh, there's it seems to be a great mystery around here. It is a great mystery. <laughs> so this much this it's one or the other though. Much much like too much mulch in the hole, we think um, moisture is is everything, and it can be deadly and it can be very beneficial. And the most common problem that we have seen is. Uh, and I was certainly guilty of this moving from the valley up to here. Too much water, too little, too frequently. Okay. When you have a drip system and you have it and you don't have a zone for that particular type of plant, it's on a general system and you have to put five heads on your tree to get enough water to it because your sprinkler system goes off four times a week. You you're getting water. If, let's use this one gallon as an example down only to here and not to the bottom of the roots. And this is staying wet when this plant likes to go a little bit dry. So if you have a plant that needs one gallon a week and it's getting one gallon, but it's getting it over the course of three days instead of all at once, that's what you're doing. You plant a, a 15 or 20 gallon tree, the moniker, the, the measure is on a 20 gallon bucket, you're gonna to wanna to put 20 gallons on it one time a week. If you're putting, because of your sprinkler system, four gallons five times a week, yes, that equals 20 gallons, but you're not always getting it all the way down to the bottom. And this is staying wet, which it doesn't want. So you're setting up a couple of different pathogens in the soil that, you're, that are hard for your plant to fight. One being dry rot, because you have too much mulch in the hole. Too much water is, um, earmarked traditionally by the ends of the leaves or the stems, uh, it's real easy to identify on a conifer. That turns brown first, but it's still flexible. So it doesn't seem right. It looks like, oh, it's dying. Well, yeah, it is. It's drowning, but it's not brittle dry. When you have it coming from the bottom of the stalk or from the inside of the leaves out and it's brittle, that's too little. I advocate more water less frequently, but if you're going off of a meter, it's the same amount of water. You're just giving it to it all at once or just twice instead of spreading it out over the course of the week. And that's pretty hard to do if you're on a sprinkler system. But I had my trees, all of my trees, I just, I just moved off the copper basin. All of my trees, none of them were on drip because of that. I hand watered them all. Is it harmful to miss patio plants? No, it's not harmful to mist them. Uh, I did see something under the microscope. The lady thought that she had um, a white fungus. And what she really had was calcium built up because she plant, she didn't change her sprinkler heads and she plant, planted where she once had turf and she had those old pop-ups that sprayed and everybody looked like they were getting a drink, but they were getting all hard water sprayed all over the leaves and it wasn't going deep enough. So when she went home and took her little spoon or her little shovel and dug down, even after after her sprinklers went off, uh, two or three inches in, it was just bone dry. And she planted one and two gallon perennials. 
So this much of that much was getting wet. This was not. And she had calcium on her leaves. She didn't have fungus. So it depends on the plant. Yes, sir. Are well, uh, wind also plays into that. So when you have real dry air, 5, 7, 12 percent, and it's windy, the leaves, um, it's called aspiration. There's a time when plants breathe, and when they open up their pores, they're, they're opening themselves to dehydration as well, because all of that, uh, all the moisture leaves. And so it does affect it, and you do have to, uh, I, and anything in pots especially, I look at when it starts to separate, you can tell if the plant isn't showing signs, but the dirt is separating from the clay or the or the pot itself. Then I will water it, and I use the number three. I water it three times at once. So I'll go by. It's like the wet sponge you find under the sink, and you put it under the faucet, and only part of it soaks up water. That's what your potting soil does. So you put water on it, and it runs out of the bottom. Well, it must have a lot of water in it. No. So you go back and you put a little water on it, and a little bit more soaks into the dirt, and less comes out. Well, it just how does less coming out of the bottom? And then I come back a third time and I just hold it there. And I really soak it. That's you're hydrating the soil. Think of that as opposed to just watering the plant. And maybe it'll help you, but it does affect. And cold does affect. People turn on more water in the hotter months. And the uh, but watch for the rot, because now you've got wet hot. Uh, that brings me to a point that's important about pots and perennials. Your pot, it, will this make it over the winter in my pot? Well, yeah, if the pot is big enough for it to not freeze the roots, you have to be holding enough dirt. The safe spot is in the ground because it's full of dirt, right? Your pot has to be really big. You can cook roots as well by having a smaller pot and it being in the sun on the porch. But if you keep something moist there, and it gets hot, then you're setting yourself up for one issue. If it's cold and you've turned off the water, like your perennials in your yard, then you're essentially freeze drying your roots. In the middle of the winter, even if you only if you got a foot of snow that's almost no moisture, you want to feed with a um, phosphate, which is root food, and deep water at least once in the middle of the winter, especially your perennials. Yes, ma'am. Um, well, they'll repeat the question for people. Aspen and pop, poplar, how long do they live? Um, I don't know of a lifespan. You know, there there isn't any reason why they wouldn't live like they live in the forest. Well, um, a birch will do better than a poplar and give you the white bark, depends on what you're trying to get out of the tree. I would check the roots. I Again, I just moved off of 5,700 feet to 5,200 feet. At 5,700 feet, I, I everyone said I shouldn't plant a, a, uh, a um, quaking aspen because uh, that it was too low and we weren't mountain and stuff, it wasn't cold enough. You drive Hacienda Drive, it's replant with, with really healthy quaking aspen. Um, Likewise, in my neighborhood of the 5,200 feet, the common is don't plant them because they don't do well. Well, there's a ton of them in my neighborhood that look really good. So it's a function of are they being cared for properly? Uh, the roots, that's a real acid lover, but they're a forest plant. They are used to a bunch of acid. You're putting them in a decomposed granite. You have to increase the acid for that tree, and they like to be deep watered. Yes, I, I and some of that is one of those like we had referred to earlier they're dying and you don't know it by the time you see the problem it it's too late to solve the problem and so when you take them out take a look at the hole is it got trails for moles does it is it full of grubs is it bone dry is it, is it holding water there's a lot you can tell when you're replacing a tree as opposed to a or a plant as opposed to when you're first planting because you're going in kind of blind for the soil and stuff like that but older 
aspen that you have planted four years ago, get some sand around the base. You put a bucket of mulch that big in the ground and its job is to decompose to feed the soil. And it does that, it decomposes and it leaves a bunch of airspace around the root ball. So go down in the creek bed and get some really nice sandy soil, pull the weeds out as you go, or buy a bag of um, topsoil, which is the dust of the mulch mixed with sand. So you'll get some nutrients in it. And then hose that into that new developed air pockets. So to replace that, I mean, I think I have to cut the You can, or you can uh, let earth do its thing and decompose that for you and dig next to it, or you could dig in it and, and while you're getting that out, take some stuff with you. But what's a, what's a good fast growing tree that is good for shade? A good fast growing tree for shade. Um, a evergreen uh, would be in the cypress or the cedars family. Arizona cypress, green or blue, uh, Deodore cedar, Atlas cedars, those are fast. Um, the for big leaf, broadleaf, big canopy, go with a red oak, a post oak, a maple. Ash trees do really well up here. If you don't have to have the, the rounded leaf that turns gold, get the long narrow leaf on a raywood ash that goes uh, burgundy dark red in the fall stunning tree two three feet a year fed properly is not unusual it's a great product to put in the ground i have a question from somebody yes. online gina wants to know what plants are toxic in the ground in the ground toxic in the ground but your euphorbia are and we have some down there that i really like your uh, rainbow ascot euphorbia and your gopher plant. Uh, there is a gopher spurge that grows wild in the woods. That's uh, toxic to animals. There's a difference between toxicity to animals and toxicity to human beings. Most um, of our systems are built very similar, but we uh, digest things differently based on what we are. The, the deterras are really pretty, but they are toxic. Um, toxins at the right level, the toxins that they have. Um, are hallucinogens, but they can kill you. Um, the euphorbia just taste really bad. And if you haven't noticed, I am very white. And when I get in the sun and I get droplets of euphorbia on it, I will get a well. And that's toxicity that I respond to. Um, some of my friends don't have that issue. Uh, I get it from the uh, cottonwood has a sap that will give the well that will do that to me. Mangoes are really bad for your skin, but you can't grow them up here, so. But there's a spurge, there's a gopher spurge. It's very similar to the gopher plant, and they're uh, indigenous to the forest up here, um, and they're really hard. That's a good one to plant, but they're poisonous. Something Let's, else? Yeah, one more. One um, more online question. One more online question. Mushrooms in the lawn, she says. She says she can't cut back on watering. Okay. So how does she get rid of mushrooms? And mushrooms in the lawn. There is a um, cornmeal is a short answer. There's an enzyme that's uh, uh, produced when the cornmeal is broken down, and it keeps the fungus in your thick turfs down to a minimum, and it keeps the fungus that mushrooms are to a minimum. You can get a, we have a copper fungicide that's more for the leaves and stuff of the tree that you can get and apply topically to the lawn in the evening. And that is a specifically for fungus that will kill it. You just spread the corn over the lawn. Yep. You found brown spots, then you've decided that that brown spot is a fungus and it is not a grub. Then you are going to sprinkle your cornmeal around that and water it in. And as it decomposes, it sets up an enzyme that the fungus doesn't like. Speaking of shrubs, we had stumps coming every night and digging holes in the lawn. Yeah. And uh, put a grub, you know, uh, treatment down and it worked great. That's a perfect example because that they are after the grub. Yeah. And instead of using a deterrent, you know, which is a smelly product, 
you go after the source. And I, I go back to my comment about male human urine around your plants. You plant a bunch of really cool uh, annuals or perennials out there. What you're trying to do is mask the smell of the new dig or to put down a smell that's unpleasant. It doesn't have to be one that you can smell or it doesn't have to be one that's unpleasant to your neighbor. It uh, just needs to be unpleasant to the skunks and the javelina. And that if you can kill the grubs with a grub killer, there's a couple of reasons why you really want to get serious and not just kind of mess around with this. The grubs, for example, are a great example of uh, a lot of grubs can really kill a young tree. And unchecked, they, once they become the, the flying insect that they are, which oftentimes this time of year is called a June bug, it's a beetle, um, they're flying around, they're not eating as beetles. They're just having, um, well, they're procreating. And then they come back to lay their eggs where they were born. So if you don't kill them, you just set up this environment where they're just gonna keep coming back. And so you, they, they need to die. So, and there's a eight, we will get some more in, but this is, some of these are grub killers that are okay for your um, vegetable garden. That BT is the caterpillar that uh, oftentimes it's an above ground grub essentially, and that will kill a non-vertebrate. Yes? Um, I have creeping roses and I came here and got the pertolone. Uh -huh. I think it's a systemic. Um, I was using Bonite before and it did really well, but you don't carry that anymore. But I've got aphids now and I can't use the knee because it's too hot. Correct. So um, I guess that, and I, I think I applied it three or four weeks ago. So you, you applied the, uh, the systemic yeah. rose food uh -huh. with systemic. So the question is, can I use a spray on to kill an aphid or a thrip after I've used a systemic. Or can I go back and get the bonite? Because that always works. Yeah, well, one or the other. Um, the, a lot of ours isn't choices. It's a function of availability because we do like the bonite product. Right. It's what we can and can't get. <clears throat> but, uh, and to answer your question, immediately you can kill them with a spray. And you can use the cyanara on them. And uh, so deep water and spray them in the evening and get underneath the leaves and the stems. The other side, specifically with roses, is do it again in like three to five days, but get all the dead wood out. In the fall, you want to take your dead wood out going into winter because the dead wood is what, uh, where the critters hide. They lay their eggs on the bark and you want to spray the bark. When a plant goes dormant in this fall, that's when you want to start with your dormant oils, even your neem oils. They will degradate the, the shell of the eggs that are laid on your bark to overwinter. And so you're suffocating actual scale, but you're also degradating the exterior of the, of the eggs that are laid. And then you, so you put it on when there's no leaves and it's cool and you put it on right as the buds start to swell. And then you switch over to your actual toxins so that you can kill whatever <coughs> fairly non-poisonously. The neem oils and the, and the dormant oils, their neem, which is a seed product, or the dormant oil oftentimes is mineral oil, and that will just suffocate what's laid on the bark. And then go into the season ahead of schedule without having to start with poisons. But yeah, you can use the drench is oftentimes used as a topical and a drench at the same time. Is it toxic to people? Uh, people that eat roses probably <laughs> should not get near the... Uh, no, I wouldn't want it sprayed on me, though. Oh, no. Yeah, in any of that application, because I'm fair-skinned, I have to wear long sleeve t-shirts because I'm just sensitive to whatever gets on me. I'm the guy that doesn't like to wear sunscreens and, and uh, because there's toxicity in that. I use a mineral-based product. But... Yeah, I cover up all the time. Whenever I'm handling any of this stuff, um, the zinc, for example, nobody should eat this much zinc. So I don't want to rub it on my skin. I don't want to get it on my skin. I'm trying to kill a rat. And so I, yeah, I'm always covering up just as safety safe goes. I got cool gloves. I have 
not neat looking. I have, you know, breathable gloves. And I, uh, and I have my little drawer full of really inexpensive sunglasses that I will wear while I'm spraying something. How soon can I go back with, say, the bond knife? Does that so much work? Well, your read your application on your systemic, and what, let that cycle pass, and then pick up the body. And you should be able to get it online. Well, I don't, maybe, maybe not. This, yeah, the soap the solution. Matter, there you go. Your really the soap option. actually <clears throat> breaks down the exoskeleton on shelled animals, on shelled bugs, and their eggs. But you're at a function of breathability now because your claws are getting the pores on your plants. That's why some of the oils don't work once it warms up. It's actually counterproductive. But you just have to be careful with that. And what I'll do with my house plants is I will use some of the systemic. The drenches are really good for my great big ficus in my house. And if something gets carried away, then I'll take it out in the evening and hose it down and bring it in after it dries. I'm considering um, planting iris bulbs in, a, in an area, and I just wondered what your thoughts were about growing them at this elevation and what I should be wary of. Grubs, uh, predominantly, and your, oh yeah, iris bulbs. Um, how to plant them, do they do well up here, and what to look out for as far as dangers go. Overwatering is is a is a big issue for them. They respond really well to putting a carbohydrate in the soil. We have a root and grow, which is ours, not a rooting hormone. Uh, they are there's iris clubs up here. There's irises left over from settlers 150 years ago growing next to the old cabin foundation up in the mountain. Tip, but I grow them. I I can't tell you how many irises I've dug up for free because people come in complaining they've taken over. They grow so well, so I'll take them. I'll come and get them. Cut the dead leaves off and stick them in the ground, and just make sure you don't have grubs. Yes, ma'am. This is our first year with a raised garden bed and vegetables and berries. Uh huh. Pots also, and with the new mulch and the new top soil and everything. At some point this season, should we be fertilizing these berries and vegetables? Oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. You're, uh, the raised bed question is with uh, how long do we go on the properties that are already in the bagged uh, dirts and mulches? How, wh when can we start fertilizing to get best results? And, and Correct? All right. So the, ours and many others have impregnated with fertilizers. Um, it doesn't take long for that to wash out. So a granular fertilizer is the safest way to, to start. Um, if you're growing, remember that flowering food is really helpful with your fruits and vegetables because uh, you don't get zucchini or tomatoes without flowers. It doesn't need to be a, um, a vinca uh, to feed it flowering food. The other thing to remember is the, the food that you feed it to create flowers is also a root food. Um, phosphate, the center number on your form, on your three digit formula is a root food with side effects that, for flowers. So it's really great for vegetables. <clears throat> well, and uh, going and for fruits and vegetables, I would recommend our uh, flower power. And the reason I like this, this is one of the chemical products that we make for ourselves as opposed to an organic. And uh, the reason I like it is because it's 1248. So 48 is your phosphate, which is huge on soluble phosphate, but 12 for nitrogen, you want all those extra limbs and stuff like that that will bring you more flowers, especially on your zucchinis and your tomatoes and stuff like that. So I do this every two weeks, regardless of what's in the fertilizer. 
And then the other question that you want to address when you're doing a raised bed and you're bringing in just bagged food or bagged dirt is does the raised bed, is it raised off the ground? Do you have airspace underneath it? That will, that will determine whether or not how you treat the soil, but also whether or not the root ball is gonna get cold in the winter time, what you plant during the winter. If it's a raised bed and it's sitting on the ground and the roots can go in and work on the native soil as this bag stuff is, is breaking down and feeding into the dirt, that's that a completely different as a technique that I prefer over one on wheels, if you will, or above with airspace underneath it. When you get to a point where you're getting, it's breaking down these soils, your mulches and your bagged potting soils, a lot of your bagged potting soils are also raised bed mix. So you don't necessarily need a layer of mulch on it. But I am prone to put a bag of uh, second year, third year, fourth year, I'm adding sand to that. And I'm getting that either creek bed sand or um, bagged um, topsoil. Yep. Go. An online question. Yeah, you, you touched on this, but Laura may be tuned in late or didn't quite understand. Bottom line is she's wanting to know about watering. She has a vegetable garden uh, and a bunch of plants and she's watering them multiple times a day for about four to five minutes. All right, very good. Okay. So Laura, what I would like for you to do, Laura's worried about watering and she's watering um, a couple of times, multiple times during the day. After one of your waterings or after your last watering, take your little spade that you use to plant these and dig up next to one of the plants. It doesn't have to be right next to it, just wherever the watering is and see what you've got. If you have uh, soggy soil, uh, that's problematic. Um, if you have dry, you have wet soil, it goes down an inch and then you just have dust, that's problematic. I don't advocate multiple waterings in a day, except for the rare occasion when it gets to be 100 up here and your plant might be struggling from heat rather than lack of water. So again, check by probing. You can get a moisture meter. Uh, you can use a piece of rebar and treat it like a toothpick and a piece of bread, run it down into the ground and pull it out and see whether or not it's dry. Pretty easy to tell. Um, I water my entire bed. I don't water the plant. I will go by and water each individual plant, but I will water my whole garden. And that can be done once a day or once every two days if it's done effectively. And that's deep watering once, not a lot, to get the same amount of water on the, on the dirt, but you're doing it all at once so you get penetration. That brings me to another amendment that's very important up here, and that is calcium nitrate. When calcium nitrate breaks down, it becomes nitrogen. But on its way, it, becomes, it has an acidic effect to the soil, which balances out your pH. Many of the things that go wrong with your vegetables, flavor, uh, tomato rot, some of your uh, blooms not adhering, you have that bloom fixer, you know, you make bloom stay or whatever, that's calcium, liquid calcium, a lot of it. Get some calcium nitrate in the ground, throw it directly in granular form underneath your tomatoes, underneath your veggies, and water it in. So that would be an application where you're watering specifically the root ball. Soak around the plant. When you get to a point with your zucchinis and your yellow squashes and stuff like that, they are shading themselves. Those top upper leaves are very important. Try not to remove them, but also try not to water them. Water from underneath. Those, those guys will droop and they'll get rot really fast. And then you will really set up problems. But if you get um, sunlight directly on your flower, or directly on the stems and you're fighting it. So it's a tight thing. You got to go underneath them. Uh, so I, I, in the garden, I don't like the spray. If you're going to set it up on a sprinkler, if you're going to do a soaking hose, it has to have big holes or it has to be on for a very long time. The little uh, uh, sprinkler heads that rain, those are really effective because they get a wider area. But again, if you're using granular fertilizers instead of the... Um, flower power that is mixed into your water. Uh, you have to make sure you get the granular into the soil. If you're just watering the plant and the granules are laying on top, 
it's going to be a very long time before you see any response to the fertilizer. Got a follow up to that? Yep. To know how often should she use that calcium product you just talked about for vegetables? Uh, maybe twice a season. Put it in the hole or put it on top when you're planting and then come back when they start to bloom. And you'll be able to tell, uh, you'll see these tomatoes and they'll have a big brown spot on them and or a small brown spot. That's not a bug boring into the tomato. More often it's a calcium deficiency. But it will also be, it'll, it'll also... Um, increase the bricks, which is a measuring component that, uh, that measures the su suspended sugars and nutrients and flavors inside of your tomatoes. It's really fun if you want to get that deep into it, but calcium's king. That's why eggshells work, but it takes a whole season to break down. So just go straight for the jugular and put some calcium nitrate on it. If you only water once a day, is it best in the morning or evening? There you go. Well, if you only water once a day in your vegetable garden, is it better in the morning or in the evening? On your perennials and your trees, it doesn't really matter. It's what's convenient because you're putting so much on it, five gallons, 10 gallons, 15 gallons. In your beds, it is important if you look at your sunlight. Once you get your zucchinis and stuff like that up and you've got shade all over your, all over your plants, all over your uh, dirt, then it's really okay to do it first thing in the morning. If it's real warm at night, you might not want to be war watering in the evening because of uh, the root rot. Without the sunshine and you stay at 80 with all this moisture, you could set yourself up for some problems. I prefer to water first thing in the morning. It's my therapy with my coffee. Okay. Yep. Um, how do you know there are resource where you can go to find out what, you know, in other words, if I'm watering everything the same and there are different types of plants, is that, is that an issue? Not so, much, not so much with vegetables or annuals, even if they're just flowering annuals. And then a follow-up question. Uh, seasonally, uh, I, know, I know it's probably a long-answered question, but I know there are certain vegetables you want to plant uh, during, you know, at a certain time of the year. In, in this climate uh, zone, uh, yeah, go. Uh, the question is about about um, watering different vegetables uh, in your garden that might need different watering requirements and seasonality of particular products. There are some your lettuces and things like that that you want that are cool weather. Uh, you plant early or late winter, and you plant late summer. And in the middle of the summer, you can get by with your tomatoes and your peppers and stuff like that. To learn that information, go to waters.com and look up learn and then look up the vegetable garden classes and, and read a couple of those. Exactly. If, it's in, if it's in here, what's that? I was going to say, there's actually a calendar that tells you that. Yeah, I'm putting the link online right now, and it'll be part of what you get for the handouts if you find that. Thanks, Brett, Ken. I appreciate that. <laughs> and then, um, yeah. And then if you're an annual, which most of your vegetables are, except for some of your tubers and roots, um, those can be all watered about the same. You're not going to, if a tomato is next to, you know, it, you're going to run into issues if one's a tuber, which is um, like um, a beet and a tomato. But they, you should have your beets almost out of the ground by the time you put your tomatoes in. Ma'am, did you have a question? Yeah. Oh, you're just fanning yourself with your hat, probably. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. Oh gosh, what a great question. What time of year should you trim fruit trees? Um, Any time. Uh, I like to trim them. There's fruit trees are they're going to put on fruit on this year's new growth is going to put next year's flowers on. So you trim to promote that. And if, unless you're trimming for size, which you can trim in the summer, uh, you want to bring the tree down. You're not cutting it down at the base. You're lowering the branches. You want to cut it early enough so that it will put on some new growth that will bloom in the spring and feed it phosphate in the fall, which is the root food that causes flowers, right? And if you're going to trim when you look at your tree and he's already bloomed out, 
and he's set a bunch of fruit. Wait for him to drop the fruit that he is going to drop. The tree will drop fruit based on what it thinks it can handle. And a lot of that is how you've been caring for it. But um, after that, then you're going to thin some fruit out based on whether or not you want great big fruit or a bunch of fruit. So inside of that, you'll have weeping branches on your good year laden with fruit and taking into consideration that you're going to produce new branches to cause it to bloom next year. You can take chunks of fruit off in a trimming fashion, lighten the load of the branch and cause it to put out new more branches so you can trim before the fruit is ripe. If you want to, in the winter, it's easy to, easier sometimes to tell what's dead and what's not, what's crossing and what's not that you can't see. You don't want anything rubbing. So in the winter, I do some indiscriminate, you know, very detailed, but I'll walk through my fruit trees and just kind of, oh, that one looks like it's going to cross with that one. That one's growing in instead of out. I'll take him out. After he starts leafing, I'll take branches off that are starving another one. This one's never going to get enough light. I'll take him out so that the plant can put its resources elsewhere. So almost any time. It depends on what you want to do. Animals that eat stuff. Yeah, animals that eat stuff. Yes. So I tried poppies, the Icelandic poppies, down to the roots. Um, so the only thing I've had success with is like the August sage and the lavender. Any, it, and I've tried, I have used the clonide um, deer way, and that kind of works for a little bit. Yeah. Uh, but you have to do it repeatedly. Yeah, the, uh, so we're talking about plants that won't be eaten and plants that discourage them and products that discourage plants from being eaten, right? Okay, so um, deer will taste everything. And it's really hard to break a deer's habits. You can break a javelina's habits. It's a great big rodent in the peccary family, and it works on smell. So it comes up on something that it doesn't like the smell of consistently enough, and it changes its path. It doesn't see well. It rubs up against things and leaves its own scent, and that becomes its new path. So some of these deterrents, including the one I've mentioned before, will cause them to change their path. The deer will come up and say, oh, I haven't tasted this in a while, and they'll take a bite of it. And if they like it, they'll keep eating. So, and that has to do with a lot of what else is available. And you can't water something over here hoping that you'll use that as bait and they'll eat that instead. You'll just attract more deer. So, um, fencing them and, uh, but other plants like those euphorbias that I talked about, this particular blue, rainbow ascot euphorbia that's down there is, I didn't put it on drip. I had six or so in my yard. They're two foot by two foot. After two feet of snow on them, they looked exactly the same. They'll get more yellow with sunshine, more uh, red with cool, and they'll bloom after the snow melts. It's an amazing plant. So incorporate some euphorbias and things like that. Butterfly bushes, they don't really care that much for. Again, they want to taste them when they're first planted. So get a way to deter that. Thank you. Uh, yeah, uh, there's, a, there's a misnomer that all... Um, evergreens they don't like. They really like the arborvitae, the one with the flat leaf. They don't seek it out, but if you go through a neighborhood that has arborvitae planted in it, nine times out of ten, it's got this really neat trim job that is just everything they can reach without having to get on their hind legs. They'll go by and they will bite a branch off of it every time, and then when it gets dry, they'll just go and eat it. So, um, yeah, there are trees also. That's another one. We were talking about the aspen and the um, uh, poplar and things of the, and that same um, family that the deer will come up. They like the feel of it on their antlers the, when they're losing their velvet. It's actually, you know, they're scraping their velvet off, but it feels good. And so don't, and it's my opinion, I don't use the black tar paint on a wound. Most of the wound covering is to keep the boring insects from smelling a fresh wound, whether you cut it or whether it's created. It could be created by a storm or by a deer rubbing his horns on it. You can use enamel spray paint and that will cover the wound. It'll cover the scent for the deer returning 
and it will cover the scent for the boring insect. If you can't match it, then you, especially on your white bark, use the white paper wrap for a season and the tree will heal behind it, but it will also uh, keep the smell, the scent of the fresh, comfortable scratching post off, but it'll protect your tree. They can still come up and scratch, but it's just not gonna take your bark off. Okay. We're about 10 minutes over. We're starting to lose our online people. All right. I suggest you sign off online and you stay and help people with questions that are here in the audience if they still have them. Okay. Um, so, bye. Bye, 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 online people. <laughs> One word of advice. If you don't buy flowers from monks, that's your contribution from preventing florist friars. <laughs>